Scholars in the Middle Ages were committed to the use of logical argument in the pursuit of truth. Today, we're going to explore how they used logical argument in pursuit of the ultimate question, whether God exists. How did they use reason to demonstrate that? Join me today for the Catholic Church Builder of Civilization. Welcome to the Catholic Church, Builder of Civilization. I'm Thomas Woods. Last time we looked at the development of the university system and the indispensable role that the Catholic Church played. We saw how the popes played a critical role in protecting the students and fostering university life and even making possible an international scholarly community. Now these days, unfortunately, the church is rarely, if ever, given credit for these things, but I assure you, everything I'm telling you is based on sources that are easily consulted. Pick up a history of the university and you'll read this for yourself. Today, I want to pursue this avenue of inquiry even further. I want to introduce some important personalities and look at things they did and said and the questions they pursued. And in particular, I want to take two famous people in church history and look at how they answered the critical question can we prove the existence of God and if so how now that's very unfashionable today because today as I said at the beginning we're being bombarded by arguments by frankly militant atheists who claim that it's irrational to believe in God that of course a critical scientific minded thinker could never believe in God well I hope to convince you otherwise today well, first, let's begin with a few personalities. It is worth noting that in the Middle Ages, there was a commitment to logical argument and a belief that logic and reason could lead you to the truth. In fact, Pope John XXI wrote a book on logic, and his textbook was used for centuries afterward and went through 166 printings. Very, very few books go through that many printings. And here is a pope a future pope writing a book of that nature. Now, more specifically, a fellow named Peter Abelard was a scholar who died around 1142. He was controversial in his day, but he paved the way for scholars who came after him. Abelard uh, was known for a, particularly for a book he wrote in, in Latin, it's known as Seek et Non. Literally means yes and no. Because what Abelard did was he took apparent contradictions for example, apparently contradictory biblical verses or apparently contradictory statements from church fathers and he deliberately juxtaposed them so that they were right next to each other on the page. And there you were face to face with an apparent contradiction. How would that contradiction be resolved? Well, the reason that Abelard's book was a bit scandalous for his time was that he didn't answer that question. He left the apparent contradictions just hanging there. And the reason he did this is he said, I, I'm a teacher for a living, and I'm not going to do my students' work for them. His students had the task of reconciling these apparent contradictions. So I always get a kick out of it when uh, young students in college would come up to me and say, well, aren't there a lot of contradictions in the Bible? Ho, ho, ho. Well, Peter Abelard was talking about this in the 12th century and was using reason to try to resolve them, so I don't think... I need some kid from Long Island to tell me this. But Peter Abelard's point was that when you have two sources, both of which are authoritative, biblical verses, for example, church fathers, but they seem to be saying different things, how can you resolve this matter? You can't resolve it by an appeal to authority because here you have two authorities that are saying different things. So how do we resolve it? Through the use of reason because Peter Abelard was convinced that truth could not contradict itself, that these contradictions must be only apparent contradictions, and that once we get beneath the surface, we'll find that, in fact, the statements can be perfectly well reconciled. For instance, perhaps the two speakers or the two verses 
are speaking about the same issue under different aspects. Or perhaps one of the quotations is taken out of context. Whatever the explanation, Peter Abelard was certain that there was one. So here was a scholar who was absolutely prepared to take apparent intellectual difficulties in the faith and arbitrate them at the bar of human reason. Now that is pretty much exactly the opposite impression that I think people have about the Catholic Church, is it not? Then we have a fellow named Peter Lombard. He lived from about 1100 to 1160, who wrote a work of theology called The Sentences that became the most studied theological text apart from the Bible for the next several centuries. Now Lombard, in his book, used authority to explain various aspects of the faith, but he did not hesitate also to appeal to human reason in order better to understand and explore the mysteries of our faith. Again, more or less the opposite of what we're told, isn't it? This, in a nutshell, is what we call scholasticism. In some ways, it's hard to define scholasticism in a way that every single scholastic would qualify uh, as one. But I think it's safe to say that scholasticism initially began as a term simply to refer to professors who taught in universities. Now, right away, that would exclude St. Anselm because he didn't teach in a university, but he was a scholastic, so it doesn't always work. But beyond that, the scholastics typically were interested in the use of reason in order to understand better and to defend the Catholic faith. They believed that there was no contradiction between reason and faith, and that if there appeared to be one, then we had simply misused our reason, we had not correctly argued the matter, or we simply understood some aspect of the faith. But the two could not contradict each other. They were two wings, in, a, in effect, that would soar toward the truth. I believe that's how Pope John Paul II put it in his encyclical, Fides et Ratio, in the late 1990s. That's exactly what St. Thomas Aquinas believed. So the scholastics are committed to this project of the use of reason in the pursuit of truth and in entertaining opposing views. Typically, particularly after the 13th century, a scholastic didn't just get up there, give his position, and sit down. He always anticipated what the other side would say. And as I said, St. Thomas Aquinas was so generous to his opponents that he would not only explain their position very persuasively, but he would sometimes think of arguments that his own opponents hadn't even thought of. And he would come up with those arguments and say, here, you can have these arguments, but I'm going to answer those too. That's typical of scholasticism. Well, let's look at a well-known early scholastic, a figure we've looked at briefly already, St. Anselm. He's a very early scholastic. He dies around 1109. St. Anselm was interested in this question. Does God exist, and can we prove that God exists? Now, it's true, over the course of his career, St. Anselm asked and answered a great many questions. But this one, it, perhaps more than any other, established him as a philosopher, because even if people didn't accept his argument, from then on, people at least had to reckon with it one way or the other. You had to at least show why you didn't agree with him. St. Anselm, in effect, argued as follows. It's just a very few steps that he took to try to prove through reason alone that God exists. And his first claim is as follows, that regardless of whether you agree with me that God exists, we can certainly agree on a definition of God. God is the greatest conceivable being. God is that than which nothing greater can be conceived. That was how he put it. So there's our first statement. God's the greatest conceivable being. Our second statement is, the greatest conceivable being has to be absolutely perfect, has to be perfect in every way, has to, per has to possess every possible perfection. I don't think that's particularly controversial. That follows from the first statement. Now, the third statement goes like this. It's more perfect if you exist both in reality and in the mind than if you exist only in the mind. Now, that might sound a little tricky, so I'll give you a, a good example. Suppose you're thinking in your mind about a hot fudge sundae, but it doesn't exist in reality. There is no hot fudge sundae in the room. It's only in your mind. I think we would all agree that that hot fudge sundae is not as perfect, that that hot fudge sundae is not as perfect as a hot fudge sundae that is both in your mind and right on the table in front of you. 
it has a perfection by existing in the world that the imaginary Sunday does not have. Well, what does this have to do with God? Well, what St. Anselm is saying is, suppose God exists only in our minds. He's just a figment of our imagination, like the non-existent hot fudge Sunday. Well, then that being is not as perfect as a being who existed both in our minds and also in reality. Now, his next step, in effect, is, therefore God exists. Now, it might seem like he's maybe skipping a few steps here. How does he get there? Well, his point is, if we've said that God's the greatest conceivable being, he has every possible perfection, and one perfection is to exist in reality, the greatest conceivable being would have to have that perfection. He would have to exist in reality, or he wouldn't be the greatest conceivable being if he were only in your mind. But we already agreed that he is. Therefore, God exists. Now, in effect, what St. Anselm is saying is that the existence of God is implied in the very definition of God. Once we unpack that definition, what do we find? We find that his existence is immediately implied. In the same way that if we really understand what the number nine is, then what follows from the definition of nine is that its square root has to be three. Once we fully understood the concept of nine, we understand its square root is three. Well, likewise, once we fully understand the definition of God, we then see that part of his nature is to exist. He has to exist. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm not so sure that one works. That seems a little bit slippery. I will point out that most philosophers have, in fact, rejected St. Anselm's proof. In fact, St. Thomas Aquinas rejected St. Anselm's proof, as a matter of fact. But there's always been, in the Western philosophical tradition, a minority tradition that has accepted Anselm's proof. And, uh, in fact, very recently, a, a dear friend of mine, uh, Bill Mara, who died in 1998, he taught philosophy at Fordham for decades. And he absolutely believed that Anselm's proof works. But whether you believe it or not, for our purposes, it's not so important. What I simply want to show you is that Anselm and other Catholics were committed to the pursuit of truth through human reason. There is nothing scriptural in that argument from St. Anselm. He wanted to show that the human mind could solve this problem. Well, after the break, we're going to see how St. Thomas Aquinas solved this problem, and I think much more persuasively. So join me after the break. Welcome back to The Catholic Church, Builder of Civilization. I'm Thomas Woods. Before the break, we just finished looking at St. Anselm's proof for the existence of God. And if you want to impress your friends, you can refer to it as the ontological proof for the existence of God, and you can sound like a highfalutin philosopher. Not that you would want to, but you can do that. Now, as I said, St. Anselm's proof was rejected by a great many philosophers. Now I'd like to consider one that was offered by St. Thomas Aquinas. But let's first begin with a little bit of background on St. Thomas and his views. Now, St. Thomas lived in the 13th century from about 1225 to 1274. So when you actually, when you consider how young a man he was when he died, his corpus of work becomes all the more impressive. How, how could you possibly have done this? How could you have possibly done it? It calls to mind the statement by St. Isidore of Seville who once said that anyone who tells you that he's read everything Augustine has written must be a liar. Well, in a way, you almost feel that way about St. Thomas, anyone who's read it all and really, truly absorbed everything. Well, St. Thomas was convinced, as were the typical run of scholastics in his day, that faith and reason could not contradict each other. And St. Thomas believed that our knowledge uh, consisted of three different kinds. For instance, he argued that some of our knowledge we know through divine revelation alone. Some knowledge we know 
both through divine revelation and through human reason, and still other kinds of knowledge are known through reason alone. So, for example, one piece of information that we have that we know through divine revelation alone would be that God is a trinity, that he's one God in three divine persons. Now, St. Saint, Saint Thomas Aquinas said that this is something we have to know through divine revelation because human reason could never arrive at this conclusion. This is an astonishing mystery. We could never arrive at this conclusion. Now, if I may digress for a moment, I'll point out that some thinkers have tried to claim that human reason can also prove the Trinity. The argument is that if we know that God is love, and we're going to make that something other than just a bumper sticker slogan, God is love, we're really going to take it seriously, then God has to have a threefold nature. Because if he is love, that means we have to have within God the two who love, because love exists between two parties, and then love is fruitful. So there has to be a third party, in effect. There has to be the fruits of that love. That's why some theologians have sometimes pointed to the family, the human family of husband, wife, and child, as in fact imaging the Trinity as a mirror into the divine economy. Economy, of course, in its Greek root, meaning household. Because, in effect, the husband and wife love each other, and the fruit of that love is their child. Well, that's neither here nor there, because the, the consensus is that the Trinity is not something that we can arrive at through strict proof. So that would fall under St. Thomas's first category. The second category, things we can know through divine revelation and through reason, would include, for example, some aspects of the moral law. I suppose reflecting on the subject of murder, just simply reflecting on it honestly, using your mind, you can probably arrive at the conclusion that murder is something people ought not to do. That even if God had never said anything about murder, you could probably draw that as a safe conclusion. Now, God has, of course, told us that we may not commit murder. And St. Thomas a answered the question that you might ask, uh, why would God tell us something that we could just figure out on our own using human reason? And one of St. Thomas's, I think, pretty good arguments in response to that is, the reason he does it is to make our lives a little easier. Because not everybody is a philosopher or has time to sit around 24 hours a day trying to deduce everything in the world through human reason. So God helps us. He tells us things that, yes, we could figure out on our own, but, well, some of us are too busy or blockheaded to do so, basically. The third area of knowledge is knowledge that is known through reason alone. And an example of that would be what causes rainbows. There's nothing in sacred scripture that explains to us what causes rainbows, and there's nothing in sacred tradition that explains it either. That we understand through the rigorous pursuit of reason. Well, now, getting back to St. Thomas, he poses the question whether God exists. Now, as I said, St. Thomas always anticipates his opponent's arguments, and he anticipates all of them. He even comes up with arguments they haven't thought of. So it's very revealing that when St. Thomas is trying to think of all the arguments against the existence of God, how many does he come up with? Only two. One of them is the existence of evil, and the other one is that the universe seems to run itself. It's like we don't need a God. It would be superfluous to po posit the existence of a God. And in some ways, these are very much the same arguments that are still with us today. Well, here's one of St. Thomas's proofs, and I'm sort of adapting it uh, for modern use. But let's begin as follows. Let's suppose you're in the deli, in the supermarket. You want to go up to the deli counter and get some turkey. You go up there, though, and you find that you have to take a number before you can get to the counter and get your turkey. So just as you're about to take your number, you see another device. And this other device says, well, before you can take a number, you have to take a number to get in line to take a number. Well, this is a very disturbing Kafka-esque deli, uh, to be sure. So you're about to take that number, and it turns out there's another number machine. It says, whoa, 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 not so fast. Before you take that number, you have to take a number. So before you take that number, you have to take a number. So you have to take a number to get in line to take a number, to get in line to take a number, to get to the deli counter. Well, suppose you turn your head and you see that going on infinitely down this supermarket is an infinite series of numbers you have to take. Well, are you ever going to get to the deli counter? Of course not. You'll spend the rest of your miserable, rotten life 
standing there trying to take numbers but being unable to do so because there's always a preceding one you have to take. You can never even take a number because there's always one before it that you are supposed to take first. You'll never get to the deli counter, that's for sure. But suppose you're wandering around all frustrated in the supermarket, you're wandering around and you see somebody with turkey in the shopping cart. Then you know the numbers must not go on forever because then how did this person get the turkey? There must have been a stopping point somewhere. Or consider this, you want to sign up for a course at a college, a special course, and you're told, well, if you want to sign up for that course, you have to go see Mr. Jones. You go see Mr. Jones, and he says, oh, sorry, before you can see me, you've got to see Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown says, before you can see me, you've got to see Mr. Johnson. You say to yourself, what in the world? Obviously, I don't need to take this course. It's going to drive me insane. You'll obviously never get in there because there's always somebody earlier you have to get permission from before you can do it. But suppose you see somebody enrolled in that course, then you know there must not be an infinite sequence of people you need to get permission from, because then how did this person get in there? Now what does this have to do with the existence of God? We have a basic insight as human beings that every effect has a cause. Nothing just exists on its own. Nobody goes down to the beach and says, oh, this sandcastle must have just been randomly created by the movement of the waves, or it existed from all time, or my watch here. Nobody would look at this watch and say, oh, I bet this has just always been there before the beginning of time. No one would say that. Okay? We, just, we know that would be nonsense. Or, and I apologize to whoever it is I'm borrowing this from. I'm, I can't remember who, what your name is, but I like this example. Suppose I walk into my office and there's a bowling ball on my chair. Now, there are many possible ways it could have gotten there, but the one explanation I will not accept is, well, it just appeared. It had no cause. No one would accept that, right? I would be willing to consider the most ridiculous explanations before I would accept that. In fact, I'd be willing to consider the possibility that the CIA is trying to spy on me and they've put a little chip in this bowling ball to make that possible. I would consider that before I would consider the ball just appeared. Well, now here's St. Thomas's proof. Every effect requires a cause. So consider anything existing. It requires a cause. Consider a thing Z. It requires a cause. We'll call the cause of Z Y. But the problem is Y requires a cause too, right? Y doesn't just exist out of nowhere. Y also has to be caused. Well, what caused Y? Well, we'll say X caused Y. But then we're back to the same problem. What caused X? X isn't just self-existing. Every effect requires a cause, so what caused X? Let's see, W. Okay, I guess you can probably see where I'm going with this. W caused X. And then we keep on going because that doesn't solve the problem either. Because then what caused W? So what St. Thomas is saying is, suppose you have an infinite series of causes in which Z is caused by Y, but Y is caused by X. X is caused by W. W is caused by V, and this just goes on and on forever. If that were true, then nothing would exist. Nothing would exist because before anything could exist, it would be awaiting a cause for its existence. But that cause doesn't yet exist because it requires a cause. And that cause doesn't yet exist because it's awaiting a cause. If everything is always awaiting a previously existing cause, the sequence of causes could never get started. It would be like waiting f uh, to try to get turkey at that hideous deli. It just goes on forever. You can never get it started. You can never get that number to get, get started. It just goes on forever. You'd never get any turkey. And in this case, nothing would exist in the world. But look around you. Things do exist. Okay? Things do exist. The TV you're watching this on exists. All these things do exist. So the series of causes cannot logically go on forever. There must be a stopping point. There must be something that exists entirely outside the causal sequence that gets this relationship going, that begins to cause the next thing, which causes the next thing, which brings all the things we see into existence. And St. Thomas says, this cause must be God. Now, some people will say, well, then what caused God? Well, that actually shows a complete misunderstanding of the argument. The point is simply that it is logically necessary, it's unavoidably necessary, that something must exist outside this causal sequence in order to get it going. Now, 
I don't think that's a dumb guy argument, right? I, I find that an overwhelmingly persuasive argument. And I used to explain it to my students when I taught uh, history in, in, in uh, New York and I taught Western Civ. I used to do this. It's a legitimate historical point. And it makes you think. Now, you don't reason yourself, typically, into believing in God. But there are a lot of people today, I think, who think that believing in God is just stupid and irrational. Proofs like this can help to break down those barriers for people like that. This is what the universities made possible, this type of rigorous intellectual environment. Pope Innocent IV, a 13th century pope, described the universities as rivers of science which water and make fertile the soil of the universal church. Pope Alexander IV called them lanterns shining in the house of God. But it's not all scholars who built Western civilization. It was people who prayed and did scholarly work, but also did physical labor. And I'm talking now about the monks, who will be the subject of our next program. The monks are probably the most versatile people who ever lived. They prayed, they were agriculturists, they were metallurgists, they were scientists, they were physicians, they provided charity, they provided inns for people. They did more than any other group of people in any culture I've ever been familiar with, and they played an essential role in building Western civilization. So join me next time as we talk about the monks on the Catholic Church, Builder of Civilization. See you then. Thank you.